packet pushers. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Packet Protector, a new podcast at the intersection of security and networking from the packet pushers. I'm JJ, and as always, I'm here with Drew Conry Murray to bring you a hot topic and the latest interesting InfoSec news. And this week, we have a special guest who's here to help us untangle some of the IPv6 security topics that you guys are interested in. And also, this week's show is brought to you by, well, nobody yet, but it could be. Uh, hit us up at packetpushers.net slash fu. If you're interested or if you have an idea for an episode takeover topic, we'll bring somebody in. Today, we're digging into IPv6 security considerations. And before you press next, because you haven't deployed IPv6 and you think it doesn't apply to you, our guest has some information that might make you reconsider. So prepare to be properly terrified. Appropriately, yes. <laughs> Appropriately terrified, yes. Speaking of, we're pleased to welcome Scott Hogue, and Scott is the CTO and co-founder of Hexabuild, an IPv6 consultancy, so who better to help us? He's also literally written the book on IPv6 security, um, and you guys might recognize the name and the voice because he's also co-host of IPv6 Buzz podcast here on Packet Pushers. But Drew, before we get into all that mess, let's look at a couple of this week's news headlines. There's some um, crazy stuff. I, I think this first one was... We found it, The Guardian, and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about this one? Yeah, so The Guardian's reporting that a German general attending an air show in Singapore may have been the source of an intelligence leak. Apparently, the general dialed into a WebEx conference from his hotel, and either his own phone or an insecure connection in the hotel allowed Russia to capture the call. Uh, they proved it by releasing a transcript of the call, and this conference call discussed German and EU military planning for Ukraine, so this was not a small leak. <laughs> So I think this was this caught my attention for a few reasons. So first, let, let's just kind of like build the scene out here for you guys listening. So a German general was attending an air show in Singapore. So he's out outside of his home base, so to say, uh -huh. um, at a hotel, dials into a WebEx. So there's a little bit of, you know, scuttlebutt about whether or not they should have been having this type of communication with, you know, military operations on a WebEx. But the truth is all of our, you know, conferencing platforms are, are pretty secure. But when you dial in with the cell phone, that kind of becomes the weakest link. And so this was kind of timely for me because I just came back from the WLPC conference, which is um, Wireless LAN Professionals. And one of the things that was going on there is our friend Peter was doing a um, like a hands on deep dive session using a new well, I think it's new to me, a new tool that's uh, a spectrum analyzer and decoder. And so basically it captures like everything across a pretty broadband spectrum. So everything wireless, you know, not just Wi-Fi, but, you know, sub sub gigahertz up, up to whatever it does. And then you can actually capture that and replay things back. And so one of the things they were doing was capturing video traffic that was being sent over the air and then replaying it, the video back. Um, after the fact. And so this is this is kind of brings up for me, you know, this general issue that we have with wireless technologies. It's kind of hidden because we have all of these communications still happening around the world. This one is cellular. We have Wi-Fi. We have all of the different IoT protocols where not everything is encrypted and secured the way that we just maybe assume it is. Right. And this one was using, you know, I don't know if it was actually a Stingray device proper or something just in that family, but you know, those are devices that law enforcement and military have been using for, for decades that kind of work like a man in the middle attack or an on path attack, like we would think of in networking or Wi-Fi. So sometimes they do passive, uh, just sniffing the equivalent of like Wi-Fi sniffing, right. but they can also do active engagements too. Yeah. The, the Guardian article doesn't have a lot of technical detail, but what I'm sort of reading between the lines is it doesn't sound like this general's personal mobile device got hacked or that the Russians hacked the hotel network, just that they were able to sort of passively capture the, the traffic uh, from this kind of, uh, from this conference call. Yeah. And a lot of cellular traffic is just, is not encrypted. I mean, supposedly when we got to 4G, um, we had protection mechanisms in place and then, you know, 5G, it, you can't even, so one of the things we call these, these stingrays like MC catchers. So they're meant to kind of detect um, and pick up the, the equivalent of a MAC address, right? But on a uh -huh. cellular network. Uh -huh. But a lot of this is just not encrypted. It, or if it if it if it would have been, um, they can do a downgrade attack and for, you know force these phones into a 
earlier generation of cellular service, especially if you're you're talking about outside the U.S. or rural areas. And then, you know, something that would have been encrypted is then not. So definitely something I think for us to, I think this is going to come back around. Um, these types of devices have been hotly debated here in the U.S. for well over 15 years. So I'm curious if this slides under the radar or if this catches attention. I mean, I'm certainly, uh, I'm sure that all of the military services are reminding folks that when you're out and about, remember to use those secure devices we provided for you. Do not use your personal device for calling into a military conference. Yeah. Now, one of the news headlines that's definitely not sliding under the radar this week is the ConnectWise Screen Connect vulnerability. So what did you dig up about that? Yeah, so ConnectWise, they make uh, remote desktop management tools called Screen Connect. They have revealed critical vulnerabilities in their software that could let attackers remotely connect to and control customer endpoints and exploits have been spotted in the wild. So this is absolutely one of the worst software products that you would want to find out has been exploited because its whole point is to remotely connect to and access your devices. Yeah, and I, you know, I've heard of this and, and seen this used a lot with clients. I've worked with um, a lot of managed service providers use this uh, tool. So this is pretty bad. And then it came out with a, well, there's been several CVEs, right? Several vulnerabilities attached to this product in the past few weeks. And one of them has issued a score of 10, 10 out of 10, which is great for bad. skating, terrible for a CVE. <laughs> yeah. Like you, you don't get points for getting a perfect, <laughs> it's, what, it's one of the scores you don't see too much. Um, But I think you know, we, we thought that was bad enough. Um, they did, I I think, so what I've heard about their response, this was actually pretty, pretty clever. They did some things with the, the, the key signing and software signing to make the vulnerable versions um, kind of inert and not work properly. Um, and they offered, I think, a free patch uh, to get people on that platform, you know, up into something that was stable and secured. So I think that's probably the best that, that a vendor can do in the face of something like this. But I think just as we thought this was kind of not swept under the rug, but maybe dealt with and, and moving on. Um, now we have new news uh, kind of ongoing that threat actors are exploiting this. Um, and there's some connections to ransomware and Lockbit, who has resurfaced. Yeah. So a bad all around. It's one of these, you know, the supply chain vulnerabilities that uh, just, is bad for the industry as a whole. Um, one other point that today I learned about AA, IABs or initial access brokers. Apparently these are criminal gangs that specialize in breaking and entering sites and then selling that access, uh, which is just another data point on sort of the ongoing professionalization and specialization in the cybercrime industry that there's just folks dedicated to doing the break-in and then they'll sell you uh, essentially the, the, the back door. Yeah. Lockbit is the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have uh, links to those uh, stories in the show notes that accompany this podcast. But let's get to the reason we're here. Uh, we're going to be talking about IPv6 security. Uh, and welcome, uh, Scott Hogue, uh, to the show. So the first question I want to ask is, I think a lot of people are thinking, if I haven't turned on IPv6 in my enterprise, do I have IPv6 risks? <laughs> Every host operating system, you know, runs IPv6. It's in the kernel by default. Every mobile device and... When you take those mobile devices, let's say to a conference in Singapore, you know, uh, <laughs> total hypothet though, hypothetical situation here. Maybe, yeah, you're a general in a defense department and you travel abroad to a, a conference and you connect your device when you're when you're at your office. You know, maybe it's a V4 only device, but then it roams and it activates IPv6, and then. You know, maybe maybe you activate your VPN or something like you should, and the so you your VPN traffic or your V6 enabled, you're running V4 and V6, and you know you hadn't your security team hadn't thought ahead about how to protect you know that general's device when it roams and gets V6, so. You know, the security team was thinking, oh, well, let's not worry about IPv6 security. Let's not create a plan. Let's not be proactive. Let's wait until the network engineers tell us that they've deployed it. And then we'll do, you know, no as a service. <laughs> you know, we'll just uh, say, no, you can't deploy IPv6. And Scott, so this sounds, if we talked about, you know, a downgrade attack on cellular, this is almost like an upgrade attack where 
instead of forcing, you know, an endpoint or device or user onto a protocol or a network that has vulnerabilities because it's old, it's almost pushing it into something that's newer that the organization just hasn't built the proper controls around that we would normally do on an IPv4 enterprise network. Exactly. So, you know, IPv6 is really just software. It's embedded in the host operating systems. It's implemented extensively on the core of the internet uh, and on, you know, wireless 4G, 5G networks. It's extensively deployed in service provider networks at in broadband internet access uh, around the world. And so you may think, oh, we're not using it internally, but then a device works remotely or at home, you have a remote worker and IPv6 is activated and you haven't considered this. You haven't taken any, you you haven't taken any steps to proactively secure when this occurs and you, you rely upon this VPN, but the VPN, the way you've deployed it, it's, it's V4 only. And so actually, and maybe you've configured no split tunneling rules to force V4 traffic to come through the VPN back to the mm -hmm. headquarters uh, location and the VPN concentrator. Well, you haven't, you haven't enforced any no split tunneling on V6. So the V6 traffic breaks out of the VPN oh, wow. and goes direct. And then you're leaking information about using <laughs> military grade weapons over the internet and you know, maybe WebEx uses V4 and V6. And so the V6 traffic broke out of the VPN and was not encrypted like the V4 WebEx traffic might have been. And so, you know, you can have this IPv6 VPN breakout unbeknownst to the security administrator. And, and so there's also, you know, when IPv6 nodes enable, or capable nodes, which all nodes really are, are on a local network, they can communicate with each other on a LAN basis, wired or wireless network, you know, on a link local basis between themselves using IPv6. They use link local addresses, they use link local multicasts. And so it could also be a method that an attacker could pivot from one machine to another on an access network in a data center or in a cloud infrastructure. And so we have this latent threat because we have you know, software that's running in every device, a protocol that's implemented on the internet and everywhere, but security teams, you know, lack understanding of the protocol, haven't taken any steps to proactively address this, and they, they lack visibility and tools and, and methods, and maybe their vendors haven't given them all the features they need to proactively secure it. So that's what creates this risk and what we call the latent threat. I wanna, so let me just I wanna, ask a little more. If, so mm -hmm. let's say an attacker gets onto a device on my network. Um, my, this uh, Say it's a server. It's dual stack, so it does have IPv6 capability. My network is only set up for v4. Can it get an IPv6 address on my network? It probably does. The IPv6 address that it has is, is what we call a link local address, an FE80 address on the interface. If you do IF config, IP adder or, uh, you know, IP config slash all, you'll see these link local addresses because you have a V6 capable device on a network. It just isn't hearing a, a router advertisement to activate IPv6 and get a global address, which uh -huh. then would facilitate internet access or off net access. But it could but still use that IPv6 address to move around internally. These link local addresses are valid unit cast addresses, just like in a PIPA address, uh, 169254 address that you tend to see with IPv4 when you <laughs> fail DHCP or it's a clue, oh, I got to go through the captive portal and, and get access. Every device has these link local addresses. They're only locally significant, so they aren't used for off-net communications. But it's a valid unicast address that nodes can communicate east-west on that wired wireless LAN segment. Got it. So it's almost like, um, I mean, just like on a on a network where we can have layer two communications, mm -hmm. you know, based at, at the Mac layer, mm -hmm. but with this basically a self-assigned IP address that's IPv6 that allows that communication yes. on that local network. On just about every network in the world, there are Ethernet 2 frames or 802.11 frames with an LLC. You know best about all of how that works, Jennifer. And those can contain 
uh, in hex 86DD in the LLC header or in an Ethernet two frame. That's the protocol that indicates there's an IPv6 packet inside of that. And on every network, wireless or wired, there are 86DD tagged Ethernet frames with embedded IPv6 packets on every network. I, I want to oh. ask about monitoring, but before we get to that, I have a mm -hmm. probably a basic basic question. And that's that I know in a lot of just traditional networking uh, deployments, software, infrastructure, routing, whatever, wireless, and a lot of applications like troubleshooting, you know, Zoom when everybody was working from home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that that most vendors have have told us is disable IPv6. It's causing some known issues. Um, and, and I say disable kind of broadly, typically the endpoints, but it could be within the infrastructure. And one of the things I've noticed, you know, anecdotally is I've disabled, you know, V6 on endpoints and during some type of a upgrade or a patch, it gets re auto magically enabled for me. <laughs> is that common? Is that something we need to layer with the monitoring, like not just monitor the, the, the network traffic, but also be monitoring the endpoints to see if that has changed. Yeah, you you should have situational awareness to be able, you know, that's SANS, you know, critical infrastructure security control number one, right? Know who's on your network. And uh, that means know who's on your network, which devices have which MAC addresses that are bound to a V4 address and which MAC addresses are bound to a link local or a global address. You need, you need that database of binding of those protocols to a link local address. And you want to know who's on your network running V4 and link local, V4, link local, global. Yeah, you need to know what's on your network and what software. And then the second one, it, security control is know what software you're running on your network. And IPv6 is software. So and you can I've... spend a lot of time going around trying to turn it off everywhere. And that's kind of futile because you can't uncompile, uncompile it out of the kernel. You can always ping colon colon one, even if you've disabled IPv6 as a protocol adapter on an interface. Colon colon one is in there. And you, you can't recompile the kernel and completely take it out of Windows. You can't, uh -huh. we don't recompile kernels like we used to, you know, decades ago. And you can't, maybe it comes in your printer by default. You can't uncompile it. You you would spend so much time trying to turn IPv6 off everywhere. And then that would just give you one more task. When it comes time to turn it on, you'd have to remember all the places you turned it off. And so you're saying you can't out, disable your way out of this? No. And I think the amount of time you would take to go around and disable it is equal to the amount of time you could enable it. When you enable IPv6, you control it. That's what we want people to do. Don't be afraid of this latent threat. Mm -hmm. Lean in, be proactive. Educate yourself about the protocol and the subtle differences between v4 and v6. Uh, create a plan. Be proactive. Turn it on, and then you can control it with your security policies. Get products that give you visibility. And but to ignore it or try to turn it off everywhere is is futile. It's an inevitability. It's an eventuality. So you just should just commit and and then control it and in, and enforce your security policies on the protocol the same as you do for v four. That's a better, more aggressive approach. Are you saying that if I go into my, you know, Windows or, or whatever printer Android device and I disable IPv6 on the LAN, it is still it is still doing IPv6 and it is still susceptible to some of these attacks? It's in the kernel. It's in the kernel. You can still ping colon colon one, which is the IPv6 loopback address. Um, and <laughs> you turned it on. You've turned it off. Great. You think the malware can't just turn it back on? That's true. I, I would, we do have monitoring available for, you know, endpoint posture, at least for traditional operating systems. So I, I would, I would, in theory, if I have a, a knock or a sock, I would at least be alerted to that if I have the monitoring in place for it. But, mm. but I'm more concerned of, 
if it's disabled and we think that's an okay, because again, sometimes there's an operational reason because it's causing problems. But from a security standpoint, you know, we're always telling people disable the protocols that you're not using. Um, and so if you're not, you know, actively using IPv6 inside the infrastructure, um, we would we would assume, okay, di- you know, disable it. But what I'm what I think I'm hearing is that does not actually solve the problem. No, because you could you still have V4 running on your network interface, right? And yes. you could tunnel that V6 traffic inside IPv4 packets and get it off your network. Mm-hmm. Exfiltrate it or create a covert channel that uses IPv6 insta- inside of IPv4. That would still be possible. Huh. Wow. <laughs> so uh, should I assume that uh, my security devices, my firewalls, my monitoring systems are uh, also able to speak IPv6, or is this something I'm going to have to upgrade for? Uh, You don't have to buy, you don't have capital costs related to IPv6. Like it's implemented in all of the host operating systems, routers, switches, firewalls, wireless, you know, infrastructure. Uh, But you may not have complete feature and functional parity in all of these security products. So you might have an intrusion prevention system. It's probably pretty good at looking at at attacks in V4 traffic. Is it as good at looking at V6 traffic? Is it able to find an application vulnerability and trigger that incident if the same attack occurs over V4 or V6 transport? So you've made your... You V6 enabled a website and you're defending it and you use a web application firewall to detect all the OWASP top 10 stuff. Is it doing all of that for V4 and V6? You know, to meet PCI compliance, you rely upon this WAF. Is it is it <laughs> successfully blocking the cross-site request forgery attacks over V6 as well as it does for V4? That's where, that's the subtlety where you may not have all the security features you need from your, your vendors. And that's part of being proactive, I think, is to is to look at all of those security protection measures you have in your environment and say, which ones have V6 capabilities? And then also sort them based on where your IPv6 deployment is going to occur first. Well, IPv6 is already being used on the internet. So the VPN is pretty important to know where you stand with IPv6 and maybe a a web-based, internet-based DDoS mitigation method, maybe something that's really important or a CASB because V6 is already implemented on the internet. But if you had an internal, let's say, a, um, a deception technology that creates these personalities and profiles of a a honey net or something <laughs> inside your network. Well, that network runs IPv4 today. So if that deception technology doesn't support IPv6, maybe that's lower on the list. So you can create a sorted list, prioritize things that are internet facing or security protection measures that are that function on the internet or are cloud-based. Those would be higher on your list and you wanna ask those vendors, where do I stand? Are you giving me everything I need to proactively protect V6 as well as V4? Just a brief pause to ask, did you know Packet Pushers has a job board? Whether you're looking to find or fill your next great IT infrastructure role, the Packet Pushers job board is the place to go. It's easy to post, easy to browse, and easy to apply. So whether you've got IT talent or you're looking for IT talent, visit jobs.packetpushers.net and get to work. That's jobs.packetpushers.net. In that everything I need category, I, forever and ever and ever ago, I feel mm-hmm. like in my last lifetime, I remember seeing uh, in some of the the federal, you know, bid responses we were writing, you know, because they were already, you know, considering IPv6 back then. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes there were kind of, I'm going to call them tiers, and maybe that's the wrong, the wrong word or not the official word, but there were tiers of IPv6 capabilities, mm-hmm. um, you know, r- starting from, d- does it, Can it get in, you know, does it have or can it get an IP address and IPv6 and then, you know, moving up into the different routing protocols, et cetera, et cetera. Is there, you know, is there something equivalent to that in terms of 
either just cap- cap- straight up capabilities or security capabilities that we like a, a cheat sheet or a tiered order of things you commonly see that look, you know, most vendors, if they do anything with IPv6, they're at least going to do A, B, and C. When you get to a product with more maturity in the space, it's going to be doing D, E, and F. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we're getting to, you know, whatever N or or Z is down here. There isn't anything officially written down, but I kind of have a a three-step process. If you, you can you know, buy a product that has a stamp of approval from an IPv6 testing lab that says, yeah, this firewall has been approved as an IPv6 capable product. But then when you look at the declaration of conformance, as the testing center might have said, Uh you realize that the product, the firewall was tested as an IPv6 router. You're like, wait a minute, because that was the test set that was used. So it's great at but, passing that IPv6 traffic. But yeah, maybe, maybe firewalls have... with permit IP any any and permit IPv6 right. any any <laughs> rules are really just slow routers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> depending on how much logging you turn on, they get even slower. Um, but yeah, and so you you bought a product or your procurement person bought a product saying, oh, we got the stamp of approval. But well, wait a minute. But I'd say in there's three... Uh, and three ways we assess a security product or any kind of a product. And it is in the three operational planes. The first one is the data plane. You know, can it forward IPv6 packets across its interfaces? Can it inspect or operate or control the flow of IPv6 packets? You know, in an IPS, can it just look at v4 and v6 packets? Um, that's one thing in the data plane. And in almost every product can do that. Every commercial firewall does that. You can create stateful packet inspection and and create objects and rules and policies. That's pretty easy. Then the next operational plane is the control plane. Uh, can it can it run a dynamic routing protocol? Does it do OSPF v3 or 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 does it do other things in the control plane? Like can I can I stop a connection based on reputation? Does the reputation filter give me just domains? And then based on, you know, badguy.com, I can block access to badguy.com over V4 and V6. You know, am I getting some kind of control information, uh-huh. reputation filtering, something like that, or I'm able to enforce some kind of a policy, something like that in the op, in the, in the control plane. And then in the management plane, uh, you know, can I configure it over IPv6? Are all the APIs, northbound APIs, v6 capable? Mm. Is it able to do logging and send off, you know, telemetry information over v4 and v6 to my SIM? Uh, is it is it able to communicate with other devices? You know, uh, and things like that in the management plane. Out, the, out of those three, which do you which? Is there a maturity that you tend to see in products? I know you said they usually start with the data plane. Yeah, so the data plane is absolutely a requirement, right? Yeah. Uh, And then control plane is good to have. It's a should have. Uh, The the management plane, if I can manage it over V4 or V6 with an API, but still make config changes to the policy over V4 or for V4 and V6 policies, that's okay. So the... The management plane is really like a could, not a must, you know. So I'd say in that order, one, two, three. But I, so I think my main takeaway here is if I'm dealing with a vendor and I ask, do you support IPv6? And they say, yes, I shouldn't stop there with the questions. I should then ask about feature parity with v6 and v4 and then talk about the data plane, control plane, management plane, et cetera. Dig, dig more deeper. Yeah, the product has 103 features of which you're using 87 today for v4. And then you want to say, do those 87 work for V6? And well, if Scott, only six... 87 is a, a generous estimation there of what people are actually doing. That's true. It has 103 features. You're using 43. <laughs> <laughs> and of those 43 are their V6 equivalents. And you realize, ah, oh, there's only 27 that are that are V6 capable. So now I got to do my math. <laughs> 16 there. <laughs> um, of those features, then what do I do? I can either, you can make a judgment call. You can go ahead and turn on IPv6 and just assume the risk and and hope that those 16 don't become a problem. You could create a compensating control. 
oh, I'm going to use another product or I have a layered security model or use another filter or a piece of open source software, maybe, maybe mitigate that with a compensating control. Or, or I just don't deploy IPv6 and wait until the vendor gives me those other features. So now I have feature parity. Or I switch vendors to get the features I need to move ahead with IPv6. And Scott, I know you, you said like, just go ahead and do IPv6 and, and bite the bullet and put the effort into controlling it, enabling it, controlling it, configuring mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and getting that visibility. But it mm -hmm. does, I mean, we're just scratching the surface here and it seems like there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a lot to learn and a lot to do and a lot to manage. And in some mm -hmm. ways we're almost duplicating everything we've built in the IPv4 infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We are revetting those capabilities mm -hmm. with V6. And then we have to kind of almost run certain things in parallel or perhaps re-architect or re-procure and replace equipment. And so I'm, I'm going to just ask, do we really need IPv6 inside? What are the benefits that, that are moving to IPv6 gives us if we're in an organization which most organizations don't need the, the the volume of addressing that we have from IPv6. Um, yeah, I guess at a high level, the benefits of IPv6 are, you know, increased, you know, plentiful number of addresses. And by uh, many organizations have a constraint uh, in the number of V4 addresses, even private addresses within their organizations. And they often have multiple address overlaps. You have IPv4 inside the network, that overlaps with some 10 space you're using in the cloud and cloud number two and cloud number three, they're all using 10 space. And we have remote users that are behind a NAT. And so we perpetuate this use of NATs and that creates little bubbles of uniqueness of the address of the IPv4 address space. The addresses are unique within those bubbles, but at the edges of those bubbles, there's NATs. And so we're trying to provide security and create situational awareness where the addresses are changing all the time. And so we really don't know who's who in our IPv4 networks. And with IPv6, the introdu introduction of IPv6, now we have a globally unique address space that can be used in a non-overlapping way everywhere on the internet, internally, cloud infrastructure, virtualized environments, containerized environments, everything has a unique address that is not changed in transit. And that makes sense. But I guess we're, we're the people that don't need it are just stuck and, you know, suck it up, buttercup. You need to do this anyway, because you're basically going to get owned one way or another through the vulnerabilities in a protocol that's going to be enabled on your network if you're not using it. And you know, all of the examples of the IPv4 space being eaten up, I'm, I totally agree with you. I think that's an artifact of just absolute terrible IP and subnet planning and uh -huh. everybody deciding to use slash 24 net mask everywhere mm -hmm. um, instead of actually planning out their IP spaces. But but I get how that happens. Um, mm -hmm. OK, so this is something we, we just need to suck it up and do it. Yeah. So do and we run like do we just run V4 and V6? together? Do we just pull off the Band-Aid and, and move to V6 so that we're only dealing with, you know, one protocol to secure? You're, you're already running IPv6. <laughs> You've already <laughs> implemented on the internet. Your remote users yeah. are using it at their houses. Your generals are using it on their mobile phones. <laughs> and, and you haven't done anything to proactively secure it. So you're behind the eight ball. You've already deployed IPv6. It was deployed on the internet. You haven't deployed it inside your networks, but that doesn't mean you're not running IPv6. Because it's on those hosts and infrastructure. It's everywhere. It's in your data center. It's in the cloud. It's in your IoT devices. <laughs> the call it's is in, coming from inside it's in the phones. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so you're late. <laughs> you need to create a plan. You need to uh, start to ask your vendors where you're at and uh, analyze that feature parity. You should be proactive. So uh, aside from, you know, 
the, the, the story of, hey, we're late, this is a risk, we're behind the eight ball that you would mm -hmm. bring to executives to say we need to have a plan for IPv6. Are mm -hmm. there benefits that I can also use to sell this as opposed to the typical security, we're in trouble, this is a problem, we need to address it? Is there a positive side that I can bring to the table when I'm trying to get an IPv6 plan yeah. going? And then IPv6 on the internet is faster than IPv4 on average. So if you v6 enable public facing applications like DNS and web applications and email, you will take it your you will have end user experience improvement by mm -hmm. so many milliseconds because IPv6 is faster than IPv4 on average on the internet because traffic doesn't have to be backhauled through a NAT. There aren't multiple NATs. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can definitely sell performance improvements. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, performance improvements. Um, and, you know, organizations tend to think, oh, we don't, we don't, we have plentiful amount of IPv4 addresses. We don't need IPv6, but they fail to realize all the places around the world that don't have that benefit. And, and other people could benefit from using V4 or V6 or use V6 and happy eyeballs is the algorithm that other devices use to choose which which protocol being be faster from their perspective. So V6 could be faster from someone else's perspective reaching you. And that's the imp improvement. The, in the and, other benefits arena, I'm wondering, because I'm, I'm sitting here, I was doing something else and uh, before this call and happened to have a map open. And now I'm wondering... Does IPv6 help decrease some of that visibility from an attacker's perspective? Like, you know, you're you're not going to run in map against uh, <laughs> a, a probably IPv6 address space in any reasonable amount of time. Is that a selling? Is that true? And is that a selling point? Um, IPv6. You can scan the IPv6 internet. Uh, there are methods now to to scan networks. If you're on a local network, scanning and finding other IPv6 nodes is trivial. If you're far away and you're attacking an organization, uh, you can still do uh, scanning creatively. You can you can find their address. Now IPv6 addresses can change over time. They can be ephemeral. We're typically used to thinking of one device, one IPv4 address, and it doesn't change that frequently. But with IPv6, we have an abundance of addresses, and they could change. And if the address changes frequently enough, it could avoid detection. And okay. So... Yeah. Talk to us about this idea of being <laughs> kind of ephemeral here. Because, yeah, we're, I think, you know, aside from DHCP, where stuff might be moved around in the same, you know, IPv4 subnet area, It we, we tend to, and especially the things that we've set, you know, reservations for or statically set, they're going to always have that same mm -hmm. address. So what what has changed here? Yeah. So imagine we're used to having servers have a fixed address and we put them into DNS as an A record and a and a pointer record. And then we hard code them as objects in our in our firewall policies. Imagine IPv6 where that server doesn't have an address. And then when the first client logs in, it asks DNS, hey, how do I get to www.example.org? And it says, well, let me check what address you should connect to. It talk, The DNS server talks to the, to the server and says, well, what address should I tell client number one? And it says, ah, give them this address. And that answers back and the client starts to talk to the server on that address. Then a second client comes along and asks the same question of the DNS server. Hey, wh what should, what's the address of that server? And the server says, ah, give client number two this other address. And so you have a, a thousand people logged into this server, each using a different address for the server. And the server and, has a thousand addresses on it that okay, it's being connected wait, wait, to. So <laughs> why? How? Why? I can't tell if this is like brilliant architecting or like a hippie free for all where there's just a, a bunch of like, you know, dancing and drugs happening in the background. Yeah, exactly. So because it challenges the way we're used to thinking about addresses as being stable, stable things. So then at the end of the day, 
everybody logs off and the server doesn't have any addresses. So then also like the attacker can't attack that server because it doesn't because normally it doesn't have an address and the attacker doesn't know those addresses. So it prevents DOS attacks, it prevents targeting that it, that system. The only users that know what the server's real addresses are are the clients and they're each using their own individual address to talk to the server. So this almost so, sounds like there could be a, a zero trust architecture play in some of this as well. Yeah, yeah. So so that's something you can do with IPv6 that you couldn't do with IPv4 is is use addresses in these these creative ways to avoid detection, provide yeah, zero trust, almost treat addresses as if, as if they were tokens, a session token. Huh. A session ID or something like that. Um Interesting. And I want to talk a little more, if you don't mind, about, you know, addressing and, you know, it, it, the equi- is there equi- there's the equivalent of some type of DHCP on V6, but there's also that the, the Slack where the endpoint will auto configure an address. Can you talk us through what that looks like and how these addresses get created? Yeah. With IPv6, you know, there's three methods of getting an, ad- an IPv6 address onto an interface. One is statically, same as we do with IPv4, statically configure the address uh, and go into DNS, put in a quad A record and an A record and a V4 pointer record and a v, V6 pointer record and create an object in our firewall. DHCP V6, really functionally equivalent to DHCP. Uh, nodes can, you know, through a relay, ask a centralized DHCP V6 server and, and get an, a lease. The third method, which is unique to IPv6, and we don't have any kind of equivalent in IPv4, is stateless address auto configuration, where the router indicates to the host, it can just come up with whatever interface identifier that it wants, the last 64 bits of the host IPv6 address, which just says, use whatever technique you want. It can be your MAC address and use this EUI64 technique, it could be a privacy or temporary address. The router doesn't know, doesn't care, and no one keeps track of this. It's stateless. There's no central database that keeps track of these addresses. And then you use the host, you use the router as their default gateway to get off net. And then maybe the, the node, the end node, receives its DNS information, either from the router or through another method. Uh, and from a security perspective, then if, if there's not a central, so if you've got this stateless auto config, mm-hmm. if there's not a way to, I don't know, capture that somehow and mm-hmm. and log that and then use that for event correlation, it sounds like for security purposes, that's not a good method to enable. And and do you enable mm-hmm. like? Is this something you enable? Do things just auto configure themselves in the absence of being told what to do? What's the default? Yeah, if you don't indicate DHCPv6 and the default router advertisement tells the hosts to do this, come up with their address statelessly. You're absolutely right, Jennifer, that there is no central database of who has what address. And if you have a security compliance requirement that says you must know what nodes are in your network, what MAC addresses they have, what port they were connected to, uh, what username and and log this information in a in a centralized log store or, or share it with my security information event management system so that correlation can occur, uh, then Slack is not what you would prefer. And so unfortunately there's a couple of host OSs out there that still don't support DHCP v6, namely Android or or Chrome OS devices. Uh. And so uh, if you're forced to do stateless address auto configuration, you have this um, this lack of visibility to the addresses. Okay, but if I'm running DHCP v6, I can get that statefulness if I need it. It's just in this SLAC case or the auto configuration case. Yep, yeah. And you can do, you know, dynamic DNS with DHCP v6. So you could take the host's name put in into DNS and tie it to the address for the lease that it obtained. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Let me, I'm still boggled about the whole using ephemeral IP addresses and tokens. And 
Uh, I like, I mean, from a security perspective, it sounds really cool. I'm wondering though, like from an architecture perspective, what is the, what is the transition for, I mean, everything that we all use for access control and policy and segmentation where, you know, our ACLs were, you know, routers or up in firewalls, wherever we're putting that policy, um, sometimes within the Wi-Fi environment, it's all network based. So what is mm-hmm. the transition then look like when we moved IPv6 and we have just crazy, wacky IP addresses moving around everywhere? Yeah, I think we're used to doing things manually by hand, right? We create objects by hand and it's very bespoke and, and we do these things manually and it's job security for a security administrator to log in, add objects and things like that. But um, we're moving into a software defined world. So many of these, um, uh, you know, what we call moving target IPv6 defense systems where the addresses change, there's a piece of software that goes and updates the security policy with the address that's being listened to at that moment. So there's a piece of software that updates the policy to allow that access to occur at that moment. You know, it's like kind of a software defined perimeter method. The software unlocks the access to the address to the server at the moment it's being allocated and assigned to that client to communicate to. And then it cleans itself up too. It removes the policy when the session is terminated. But you're saying the policy can follow the change in IP addresses? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have fully qualified domain name objects in firewall policies today where we just put in instead of an object and its V4 address, we put in a fully qualified domain name and it does a DNS lookup and then puts the address or addresses of the fully qualified domain name object into the firewall policy. And it would pay attention to the TTL and DNS and say, oh, the TTL is 10 minutes and change and refresh itself. Or when DNS gets updated, it updates the firewall policy. And that makes total sense. So th- this makes total sense to me for cloud environments and architectures and mm-hmm. SDP. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm thinking, you know, on the LAN is where this to me gets a little twisty because I do think it is re-architecting uh, stuff that's already there. And I'm just kind of curious. So what you've just described makes sense with, you know, having the host name and a you know, server or something that's that's more persistent than an endpoint. Mm-hmm. When we have all of the IoT type things or just, you know, users and other devices moving around that don't have, you know, DNS entries th- the way that we would typically do them in IPv4 networks, what, wh- how, how are we putting policy around a group of users or endpoints, uh, like a device subset that would typically be in a subnet or a VLAN as they do or don't have access to this other segment or set of resources. Yeah, if you're if you have security policies that are based on identity and you're allowing access to a user, so someone in the human resources department has an identity and they're able to access the payroll system and based on their role and we know that they have a V4 address and that's and that's can be gathered from the identity access system and grants access to them based on their address or the software defined perimeter controller <laughs> tells the SDP gateway, you know, the, the policy decision point can tell the policy enforcement point, Hey, unlock access for this HR user at this V4 address to then communicate to the HR database that system should communicate the v6 address of that user's laptop to unlock access to that application for the v6 address so we should be using you know identity and things like that and zero trust methods and those methods should know that the computer has a v4 address and a v6 address and the unlock access for them could that also apply to you know, headless devices, uh, IoT devices that I don't have like a typical user access credential for, but maybe I can do a device fingerprint and apply a policy that way. Yeah, but also if the if the IoT device did DHCP v6 and it had a name, and then you follow that name, and then whatever its address is 
or whatever lease it got. Mm -hmm. Dynamic DNS, use a DNS object for that. Or you might create a more coarse rule and saying anything on this slash 64 IPv6 prefix is going to be in this IoT network realm. We trust it in this way and we give it access to the to the edge compute that's you know, edge compute device that's capturing all this data from these IoT network devices. Wow, we have struck a rich vein here uh, <laughs> of things to consider and think about. Uh, <laughs> Scott, I mean, we, we've already run much longer than we typically want to run these shows, but I appreciate you, you know, going down all these rabbit holes with us. Um, as a general sort of last word or takeaway, anything to kind of like that folks can take away with them to think about IPv6 as a security person? Yeah, I'd say, you know, reach out to your vendors. Just you can be proactive by just starting to understand where you stand. Ask all your vendors what their IPv6 capabilities are. Just make sure that you have all the capabilities for v6 when it comes time to turn it on and then start to formulate a plan, you know, to educate your teams about it, start to be proactive, start to assess, make sure you have visibility. What, where is IPv6 being used in my network? You can start to do these things today uh, that don't cost you any money, but you're starting to be proactive about IPv6 rather than reactive. Got it. Yeah. And also I'll just put in the plug here for the IPv6 Buzz podcast on the Packet Pushers Network. I know the Packet Pushers uh, podcast can get nerdy, but I think of all the shows we have on the network, V6 Buzz is probably the nerdiest. So <laughs> if you want to go deep, go listen to what the IPv6 Buzz crew is up to. I'm going to have to hop over there myself because I have more questions than I did when I first came in here. Just it's, uh, <laughs> We're scratching the surface. There's, there's, I know, Scott, my questions are remedial for you at this point, but I'm, I'm hoping um, my ignorance here will, will help our listeners as well, who might not be as in tune and listening to the other podcasts. So um, this is really helpful for me. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. But you know more than you give yourself credit for, because I think for security professionals, all of the, what they know and their decades of experience like yours are transferable to IPv6. You you just need to learn, your people need to learn about the, this other protocol, but it's there's no inherent security built into IPv6, just like there's no inherent security built into IPv4. You're applying the same techniques that you're familiar with to IPv6. So don't be afraid of it. <laughs> I encourage people not to be afraid of it. You know a lot. You have everything you need to know. Uh, just apply it to IPv6. Awesome. Well, thanks, Scott. And uh, we will definitely be having you back. Um, thanks, Drew. And thank you guys for joining us for another episode of Packet Protector. You can find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. And if you want more nerdy goodness on networking, wireless, cloud, network automation, and more, go to packetpushers.net, where you'll find thousands of hours of free technical content for your listening pleasure. Thanks for listening. 